Hi everyone. Today I'm going to be explaining atomic spectroscopy in terms of the various elements and the various ions of those elements and why each of these elements produce a different color of flame during the standard flame test. Many of you have probably seen or even done this flame test in which different elements are heated and then they give up different colored flames such as potassium emitting a bright violet light or lithium producing a scorching red light. The Schrodinger test can be used to identify elements within ionic compounds by corresponding the color of the light to the metal. So although the science demo seems really fairly common and basic, it's not common knowledge as to why this happens and why these different colored flames are produced dependent upon the metal used. So during this video, I'm going to explain various flame colors in relationship to energy, wavelength, and light. So to begin, a quick introduction on atomic, atomic spectroscopy and the Bohr model is necessary. Atomic spectroscopy can be explained by the electromagnetic radiation, so light, absorbed and emitted by atoms. So here we have an atom. And over here, we have various sources of energy. These can be represented by electricity, light, and heat. Heat and electricity are often utilized as energy absorbed by atoms. Then, which in turn, these atoms re-emit this energy in the form of light. This form of light is what we see as a visible spectrum of light, which can be represented by the colors red, orange, yellow, blue, green, and violet, or Roy G. Biff. So, as you probably already know, wavelengths determine the color of light emitted based on the standard electromagnetic spectrum, or this image right here. So, with this information, scientists can take atoms of a particular element and produce what is called an emission spectrum. This emission spectrum is the basis for how we know which flame colors certain elements produce. An emission spectrum for any given element is the exact same for that element every single time. But each different element produces their own emission spectrum. So, this emission spectrum right here can be made when scientists take, um, take atoms of a particular element and then separate the wavelengths of light. And so that each time a line is produced at each wavelength present. So, Scientists can take these lines and match their position on the electromagnetic spectrum to determine which colors are present. So here you have about five different elements, and you can vaguely see the different colored lines, and then they can take these lines, correspond them to the electromagnetic spectrum along the nanometers on that basis, and then understand which color of light is emitted from this element. Now that we understand how light, wavelength, and colors are all related, we can now incorporate energy into the mix. As we talked about earlier, atoms can absorb energy in the forms of heat, light, and electricity. And that often these atoms will release it in the form of light that we refer to as the visible spectrum of light. So, light is, this co light is also corresponds to these different colors that we have. So as we all know, electrons orbit, around, electrons orbit around the center of an atom. But what may be new information to some is that these electrons, although they appear to be randomly flying around the atom, they actually exist in specific patterns based on the amount of energy that they contain. 
This can be visualized by this really basic picture in which these ovals, these black ovals around the area of the, the center of the atom are what we're going to refer to as the valence shell. And that each of these orbits houses a different level of energy per electron. So, electrons occupy orbitals. And these orbitals um, are determined by the amount of energy that, each of, that they, can, they can contain. So now that we know this, we can really get into how those different colored flames are produced. So, photons, or you can also think of them as packets of light, can interact with electrons orbiting around this atom, flying around the atom. So since these photons, or packets of light, are technically containing energy themselves, they can cause it to gain energy. So when an energy, so when a photon and electron collide, it can cause this electron to absorb energy. And therefore, this absorption of energy causes an electron to rise to a higher orbital. So a higher orbital pushes it further away from the nucleus and allows it to have more energy. So the in a really basic form, you can describe that an electron is being taken from its ground state and put into an excited and unstable state further away from the nucleus. So, since this electron is now excited and unstable, it's going to want to return back to its normal state. Therefore, an electron will drop back down to a lower energy level. An electron dropping to a lower orbital is the prime root of the colored flame. So, after an electron gains energy from heat, interaction from interaction with heat, interaction with photons, or electricity, it will move into a higher orbital and become an excited and unstable electron. Immediately after the electron, though, it will drop back down to a low, lower orbital. And while doing so, it will release the previously gained energy in the form of light. The relationship between the energy that this electron releases when it's falling back down to a lower energy level, and then wavelength and frequency can be expressed by the equation E equals HC divided by lambda, where E is equal to the energy difference between the two levels, and C is a constant for the speed of light and is valued at 3.00 times 10 to the 18 meters per second. H, which is better known as Planck's constant, and is valued at 6.626 times 10 to the negative 34th joules per second. And lambda is equal to the wavelength. This equation shows the relationship between the amount of energy absorbed from the photon, E, and the wavelength of light a.k.a. color. The one last final step is to explain why these colors vary from metal to metal or from element to element. So, a quick recap about what we've learned so far is that we understand that we have electrons and they occupy the space around the atom in specific orbitals or valence shells. These electrons occupy these orbitals based on the amount of energy they contain. Therefore, Electrons have the ability to rise to a further, to a higher orbital or to a higher level when they gain energy from heat, electricity, or light. When they make this rise, we know that they, we now know that they are absorbing energy and becoming an excited and unstable electron. So naturally, the electron will fall back down to a lower quantum level and therefore must release energy to satisfy the requirements of that orbital. It is that energy emitted in the form of light that produces the colors that we see. We also know that the colors 
can be determined using the equation E equals HC divided by lambda, where we see that the amount of energy E is directly proportional to the wavelength, lambda. By determining the value of lambda in nanometers, we can match it to its value on this, the electromagnetic spectrum, and determine its color. Which leads us to our final lesson as to why do scientists use the flame test as means of identifying metals. Each and every single element has their own specific set of energy levels. So in extremely simplified terms, we can say that because each element has their own energy levels, they have their own requirements for the amount of energy it takes to rise and fall between these energy levels, which is represented by the letter E. Since they have their own E in this equation right here, obviously they must have different lamps because, like we said earlier, they are directly proportional to each other. But a more in-depth view explains that each metal differs because of the number of protons and electrons. So a statement that we can make is that every single element has the exact same series of valence shells. This is not to be confused with my prior statement, that each element has their own set of energy levels. So now that we've cleared that up, we can go back to the fact that almost every single element has the same set of valence shells in the same place, and that the movement of electrons between these levels is also relatively the same. But what is not the same is the amount of energy E it takes to transition between these levels. This is dependent upon the attractive forces between the electron and the neutron. And what, this is what explains why different metals have a different E and therefore produce different colored flames. The best way to further explain this is through, through an example. Let's, pre let's pretend that we have two elements. We have lithium and we have helium. We all know that both helium and lithium have two electrons represented by the E minus and that these two elements have relatively the same valence shells. What's different though is that if you count, lithium, ha lithium plus has three protons. But helium only has two protons. Now we all know that protons and electrons are attracted to each other. So if you visualize this, you see that the lithium plus has three protons pooling, and they're attracted to the electrons, and they pull them closer to the center of the nucleus. And that helium does not have as much attractive force as lithium, because it, does, it only has two protons pulling the electrons back towards the center of the nucleus. So therefore, we can say that the more attractive force from the protons, aka more protons, pulls the electrons back, making it harder for the electron to rise up to the next valence shell. Therefore, the more protons that are pulling the electrons in, the more energy it would take for those electrons to pull away and break into a higher orbital level. So therefore, this explains why different elements produce different colors, because the amount of energy that is required to transition between levels is controlled by the number of protons versus electrons, which obviously varies from element to element. A little bit simpler way to visualize this is to picture you have rubber bands, and you have two rubber bands, and they're attached to a board. If you take a rubber band and you move it to its resting position, it lays flatly like this. But if you were to take it and stretch it, it, causes, it takes energy to move it. But let's say you now put four rubber bands on and that the rubber bands correspond to the number of protons. The more rubber bands or protons that you try to pull down, 
the more energy it takes. So as you can think of it as that, the more energy is required by the more protons that are pooling and causing an attractive force. And since we know that energy is directly proportional to wavelength, and wavelength is directly proportional to color, that is completely how we can explain while different metals, different elements, and different ions produce different colored flames in standard flames. Thank you so much for it.